Everyone, this is Ross Ratty, and welcome to another episode of Fruit Talk. This is the podcast-style video that I do for you guys. Every Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern, we talk a lot about fruits and vegetables and how to use that stuff in the kitchen, the really rare and exotic things, why you should be growing fruit. And uh, that's actually exactly what we're going to be talking about in tonight's episode is why you should grow fruit at home. And um, there's a million reasons, and we talk about this a lot, whether it's on the the podcast or if it's on the YouTube channel, that's what I try to be to you guys is a source of inspiration and it's become very apparent. More, It gets more and more apparent every year, every day that goes by why it just doesn't make sense not to grow fruit. I mean, I think everybody should be growing their own food. I don't think that there, um, you know, there should be a single person that doesn't. I think we should make ops, you know, grocery stores obsolete. And, you know, it's not because I have something against them. It's just that there's so many reasons I'm about to list. And there's probably more reasons that I'm I'm not going to list because the list is endless. I mean, you know, there's a lot of obvious ones. Um, but they, it's become more obvious as time has gone on. Certainly in, um, you know, in the last few months of me being able to harvest very different things from the yard... Um, putting them all together and really understanding the huge differences there is between the store and what you can grow at home. That's, to me, the biggest thing is getting this huge diversity that you can't – some of it you can't find at the store, but also the stuff that you can find at the store, 95 times out of 100, it's better than the store. And I've been really shocked to learn that, and I've been really upset as well because every – you know, every time I taste something new, I realize, wow, I've been just deprived for a number of years. Fortunately, I'm young. You know, I'm only 28 years old, so I have a long, a longer life to live than maybe most of you guys watching this video or listening to the podcast. But, um, you know, at least all of us can repair what has been done going forward. You know, the best time to plant a fruit tree, as they say is 10 years ago and the next best time is today so hopefully today or tomorrow when you guys um, are get done work you can go outside and plant yourself a tree based off of this video so that's the goal but I want to say um, some of the things that I've, I've been tasting I want to talk about some of that that I've had so far this year which really drives I think the point home of again why either either things you can't get or things that are just far superior. So let's start, I guess, from the beginning of the season. We can go way back. Uh, we can scroll back here and show you most of the things in terms of photos that we've been harvesting. And we started out very early with strawberries. And I'm mostly talking about fruit. I mean, I don't take photos of every vegetable I grow. But certainly with the vegetables, you could even rewind even further and we could look at some salads that I was eating um, just about every day. You can see in the garden bed here in the cool oven crops, we had things like, um, you know, that were ripening very early. Things like spinach and arugula. We even had sugar snap peas very early, which really are incredible. I mean, I've mentioned it before. That's like the best snack very early in the year super sweet super good now mine have petered out i mean it's just uh it's just too warm for them um i've also was able to harvest you know different types of asian greens like komatsuna and tatsoi you know uh swiss chard i mean there's a huge amount of things you can get very early on in the season and it was very apparent mizuna was another one and I was eating really, really nutritious foods for a long time. It was really good, really healthy. Then we moved on, like I was starting to get to, was our fruit. And we finally got some strawberries around the end of May. Middle to the end of May, it says May 20th right here. And we got very soon after our first strawberry, we were getting bowls of strawberries. And I've probably harvested, you know, those like really large size freezer bags 
you know the the larger size of the Ziploc freezer bags I have about four full bags that are stuffed even even width wise not just lengthwise um, I stuffed as many strawberries as you could in four bags and that's how much strawberries I have ready to be made into jam so I had a you know just an unbelievable amount of strawberries it was even tough it was tough to keep up with it to pick them every day um, you really have to get out there every day, especially if you want them fully red. But it got to the point where I needed to pick some every other day. So I was getting out there and getting some that weren't as red. But in the end, if you get them fully red, they're way better than the store. Even not even fully red, they're still better than the store because you've got them much less, much less firm. You know, these are strawberries that have a better flavor, bred for... A softer strawberry not necessarily need that firmness for the shelf then after we got the strawberries we were getting the honeyberries and the honeyberries were pretty new I mean I've had some last year but they're really complex interesting fruit we follow that up by a huge garlic harvest still harvesting more vegetables things like radishes things like turnips uh, by the way every single thing I'm mentioning here is better than the store or you can't find it at the store until I mention what is not as good as the store, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, then we we're, you know, we were looking at things actually called gumi, which you can't find, which are really incredible. They really do taste like gummy bears when you let them dry. Um, they're really interesting flavor to them. Here's a nice little photo of some things that I was harvesting early: the bush cherries, which we picked a bit early in this photo. Our strawberry, our Mara de Bois, we have the Gumi, we have the Honeyberries. Keep going, we got more Gumi. Then we started getting red currants. And the red currants, man, they are so productive, even good fresh. And I have another whole freezer bag full of currants, full of red currants. And I should have, um, very soon, I think I have like, I think I have about a, a freezer bag and a half of black and red currants. Because then shortly after the red currants, we got the black currants. And all this, while this is all happening, by the way, our heat-loving crops are getting going. I'm also getting things like carrots, you know. Um, other things like shallots, elephant garlic. Um, we had green onions earlier in the year. Um, let's see, we have mint, we have basil at this point. Um... You know things are really starting to grow it's it's early June at this point and believe it or not I have a very early apricot called early blush that ripened for me that absolutely blew me away we talked about how good those were in the episode of fruit talk last week then we actually believe it or not because we have a greenhouse we have the figs in the greenhouse we were getting figs in early June um, so we're getting bravas at that point not the highest quality, but still way better. Then we also got something called garlic scapes. I forgot to mention that before we did our garlic harvest in early June, we were getting uh, scapes way before that. And the scapes are incredible. I, they come in sometime in May. And that is a just a beautiful, beautifully cooked bunch of garlic scapes there. You chop them up. You blanch them for about a minute. And then you um, you throw them in the pan with some olive oil. You don't even need garlic. You can throw on some lemon in there. Put some cheese on at the end. Obviously, salt the water when you blanch when you blanch them. And then get some color with it with the pan, and they come out just amazing. Uh, they really do. They're better than asparagus. They're better than um, you know well cooked broccoli. I think. Um, what a weird treat that they are. We also were cooking some spinach up here with some nice garlic and olive oil. Um, here's a nice little photo that I never showed you guys, but here's the interestingness of the honeyberry where and why you have to wait, excuse me, to pick this longer is that it's got a exterior shell almost or an exterior berry, you could say, that gets blue, but the inside doesn't get fully blue. So you have to wait for the inside to turn fully blue, and you'll never really notice until you peel it back. And then you can see actually two berries on the inside. What a strange fruit. Um, yeah, and here's actually our black currant harvest and more red currants that we have later in, um, later in June. 
we started getting some blueberries actually midway through June, and then the straw the blueberries have been going nuts ever since. Um, and believe it or not, we have broccoli. We've been getting broccoli at this point. Um, and we've been getting some other types of brassicas as well. I would have been getting some cabbages. I definitely have been getting some Chinese cabbages. Um, I've also been getting um, something called uh, kailan or Chinese broccoli. Um, what else do I have in that bed? I also have been harvesting onions. And I've been doing onions a bit early. So I, take, I put the onions in a nice little bunch. I multi-sow them. And then they kind of grow apart from each other and you end up with something like three to five onions per hole and they grow away and they don't really get to be the largest onions but you can come in there and prematurely harvest some onions that have got some size to them and the broccoli just comes out phenomenal especially when it's paired with you know some onions some garlic um, we also got some um, you can see right in here these are the flowers of the potato so we were harvesting potatoes, of uh, the early potatoes. Uh, you can kind of dig around the surface and get smaller potatoes that haven't really developed that thick skin to them that you see at the store. They're really buttery, really nutty, really easy to eat, incredible potatoes. And you can't get them, well you can actually get them at the store, but you pay a lot for that really small bag of potatoes that are filled with the small potatoes. They're usually multicolored. You know I'm talking about the yellows, the reds, the blues. They're all over the, uh, the country now at this point. But that's one big perk of growing potatoes. First off, you can't find garlic scapes as far as I know. They're too expensive. They're also hard to, hard to get, hard to come by. Um, We've also, at this point of the season, had things like our first raspberries. And the raspberries were coming in um, not too much, but they're coming in enough to where you probably don't have to buy raspberries at the store, especially if you got enough plants, you have the right varieties, you shouldn't have to buy any. They're so abundant, they're so easy to grow, and they taste way better than the store. So far, everything I've mentioned you can't get or is better than store quality. Um, except for the blueberry and the blueberry I'm noticing on at least on my plants is that the only real benefit to the blueberry so far is that I can get larger berries and I guess that's nice but then again eating a larger piece of fruit isn't necessarily the best it's just it makes it easier to pick in my opinion and I'd rather pick fewer larger blueberries than many smaller blueberries um, and the other thing I mentioned so far is the bush cherry that we've been getting as well as our Bing type cherries, the sweet cherries that get a dark purple. Those um, we also had at different times of the year, sometime in, in June. And they're not, they just don't live up to it. You know, they, they've got some nice flavor to them, but as we talked about in last week's episode, they just don't have what it, you know, what it takes compared to the store. The store is able to you know the commercial growers of cherries are able to produce really high quality cherries and blueberries we talked about that last week um, in addition to that we're getting things that are pretty much overlooked at this point um, we're getting things like nasturtiums and borage and cucumbers um, if you did everything right at this point I probably should be looking at tomatoes very soon I probably be looking at peppers very soon I'd probably be looking at eggplants very soon, um, but the cucumbers so far are actually putting out very small flowers, um, and you can eat the flowers, and you can also eat the the fruits, the very small fruits that are on the flowers. So, um, you know, you can eat them in an immature state, and they're really, really good that way. The flower is very tasty. Borage actually tastes like some cucumbers. So essentially at this point of the season, here's some apricots. You know, here's a nice little photo here of some of the flowers, the nasturtium flowers, the cucumber flowers, the borage, the goji berries we've been getting, the gooseberries we've been getting, which of course you can't find at the store. Then we stepped up our game even further. Look, here's the onions, the shallots, the garlic, the broccoli, the potatoes. Then we stepped it up even further and we got something called the Morris Nigra Mulberry, which blew me away. Very, very good. We've got a video coming out on that soon, hopefully. 
Um, and then additionally, which I had, I don't have photographed just yet. It's on the camera upstairs. I have to import the photos into the computer. But we got our first peaches, our first nectarines, more apricots, our first plums, and our first apple, which is kind of insane to think about how all this is coming together right now. And it's just after the summer solstice, just after the longest day of the year. We're just now in the summer, and we're getting all these different types of fruit. And it's really becoming very apparent how and why you should be doing this. It just makes a whole lot of sense. I don't even have to go to the grocery store if I wanted to. Um, you know, Maybe I can get select things that I can't really grow here, but everything is of better quality. It's so nice to be able to go into the backyard and pick what would be $3 worth of blueberries or what would be six dollars worth of cherries you know or you know i can't even buy this quality that's another thing is that yeah you're saving money you're getting it in a higher quality but some of this you can't even buy you can't get it like we mentioned or you can't get it at that quality no one's going to sell it to you at that quality because the only way they can get it to you is by shipping it and by shipping it well you're just not going to be able to ship something that is perfectly tree ripened. It's just not going to happen. So, I mean, it's just there. If those reasons alone don't make sense to you, I don't know what else to say. Um, some other reasons, I guess, we can get into is what about your health? What about your health? And it's not just the nu nutrition in the food, the nutrition in the soil. I think a lot of people really understand that. I mean, that's very you know that's obvious. Fruits and vegetables are good for us, right? Um, also, you know, what is it that you're using on the, the produce that you're growing? Are you spraying it with anything? You know, um, there's also things that we don't really necessarily know too much about. Think about, um, you know, because it's so local, what that can do to your health. Because it's local, it can boost your immune system. Because it's being pollinated by bees. As an example, think about the honey, right? that bees produce. If you get local honey, that does amazing things for your immune system. You know, um, think about all the antioxidants that are in these foods that are increasing because, well, you're letting it ripen to a far, a, a much further state. It's getting more color. More color means more antioxidants. Um, you know, it just really is a diverse, I mean, if this photo here doesn't really prove it, look how diverse in color that is. The amount of antioxidants is crazy in that. Um, you know, I have a photo I took today just like this with different fruits on it. Um, you know, it just really is something special that. I mean, I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to just keep uh, saying you got to do this. You got to do this, but you really got to do this, guys. And now there's some other things that I want to mention about your health. You know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like, oh, I have all the science behind all this. But there certainly is something that growing food does for your mental health. And if anyone out here that's listening has depression or anxiety, any sort of mental health issue, growing food just immensely helps with uh, your mental health. And I could speak to this personally. I'm not going to go into crazy details about it, but they say that there's something in the soil, some microbe or something, just putting your hand in the soil really helps your mental health. And without a doubt, your mental health is improved by knowing that you have security, that you have food that you can grow, you have the skill that you can grow, that if you're poor, if you don't have money, you don't have, some, you don't have a place to live, you don't have this, you don't have that. You always have the ability to grow food from the land. And that gives you that sense of security. You know, a lot of you guys may not get that, you know, but for those people who have had $1 in their bank account, you know what that's like. Um, you know, for those of you guys, when it finally clicks and you realize, oh, I have the skill that I can use in any situation in nature that I can do pretty much anything I want I'm I'm now a part of nature and now this is all in your head and whether you know it or not there's no real moment it changes who you are it changes how you think and it also changes your brain chemistry you know there's a there's also 
I'm sure there's an immense amount of serotonin every time you pull something out of the ground. It's so gratifying. You're so proud. You know, serotonin by definition is like that chemical I think that you get um, when you feel a sense of pride for some for either yourself or for someone else. So uh, if your kid succeeds, you're gonna f- get that serotonin boost. If if you are succeeding and you're growing something from seed, just knowing that it grew from seed, just knowing that you grafted your own tree and then it grew five years later into this monster that put out hundreds of very tasty fruit, you know that you have this sense of pride and, and serotonin, of course, that goes along with it. Um, you know, there's a huge benefit, guys, that really it's not enough to just talk about it and say it. You have to really experience it. Okay, so we talked about health. We talked about you can't just get the stuff at the store. It's a better quality. Um, you know, what's some other... Okay, well, there's the... Obviously, we talked about saving money. I mean, I wonder how many strawberries this was that I harvested this year, you know, in terms of how much money this was. Me turning it into jam, you know, what that's going to be like. It's just incredible. I mean, I would say I probably harvested roughly a hundred dollars worth of strawberries at least. You know, one pint is about two fifty on sale. Conservative there. Um, of course, they're poor quality strawberries. How many strawberries is in a pint? Maybe about fifteen. Um, so I think I probably got somewhere around a couple thousand strawberries. Um, so let's say we got about 1,500 strawberries divided by uh, 2.5. We're looking at $600. Oh, no, no. 2.5. That's not right. My math's wrong there. <laughs> $1,500 divided by, or 1,500 strawberries divided by 15. You're looking at 100 packages of strawberries, yeah. So then you'd multiply that by 2.5 and you got $250. So that's pretty impressive. That's that's something right there. I mean, that's that's quite a bit. Um So what else? What are some other reasons here why we should grow fruit? Well, I think there's also a sense of community behind it. And you know, you could be a lonely gardener, but there's always somebody out there who's messaging me. I, of course, because of the YouTube channel, of course, because of the podcast. But if you join an online community and share what you grow, you can make friends very, very easily. There's always some annoying neighbor that <laughs> that wants to eat the food or someone you, you can share the food with who really likes it, who will ask you for it. Not that it's it's too annoying, but it can be annoying if they ask repeatedly, but that person then becomes your friend. You have some bond with them. You have some way of connecting with them and and, and sharing something with them. Um, you know, you can always bring something to somebody's house. You always have something to bring. You always have something interesting to share that somebody would be very interested to try. And there's that experience not just through a community of then showing them what this thing tastes like. Uh, just past weekend, this past weekend, I had a friend that I've been friends with since I was a kid, and uh, I haven't seen him in a while. We, I see, I see him every once in a while, but we haven't really connected all that often in the last, uh, let's see, fifteen years. Um, although he's the greatest guy, but he told me he messaged me. He said, "Hey Ross, I'm, I'm I want to have a fig tree." And I said, all right, well, come on over. We'll give you a fig tree. And we'll let, you know what? In fact, I'll do you one better. We'll let you try it because he's never had a fig tree. He's never had a fig straight off the tree. He's only had them dried or from the store. And he loves them at that point. And he knew, all right, well, I know a guy. So he came over, gave him the fig. He tasted it. He, he loved it. I mean, plain and simple. I don't know how you couldn't, to be honest with you. And he was hooked. And he realized, oh, Ross, now I get it. I understand why you're doing all this, why you have all these fig trees, why you spend all this time. You know, it's starting to make sense. 
Um, so there's that nice little sense of community, bonding, friendship. Certainly, through growing anything. Um, you can make friends in any hobby. You know, so I guess that one's a given there. Um, what else? What other benefits here do we have? Um, hmm. You know, it's a shame we're not doing this one as a live stream because if we were, I'm sure a lot of you guys would be chiming in, talking about all kinds of really personal beliefs and personal um, things that have happened to you from growing food. Um, you know, it's really nice to just be a part of this hobby. I find that there's very generous people in this hobby that surround me, that reach out to me, that um, will just even simply give me free stuff. You know, you give me something, I give you something. You know, uh, that's how it works. That's how life is. Sharing, um, you know, it's it's almost like you give something and with the knowledge of you're going to get something back. So it's almost a bit selfish. But, uh, you know, that's just how it is. I guess once you fully understand how karma works or fully understand how um, this hobby is, it just it just comes back to you. So... Anyway, guys, I'm going to end this episode of Fruit Talk here. I mean, that was, I think, the greatest uh, few reasons that there could be. I mean, I'm sure there's something out there that you guys have, have want to say about this, and I encourage that. Put that down in the comments. Let me know, you know why it is that you guys grow fruit, and I'm, I'm sure I'm going to be really happy to read it. So, okay, guys. Take care, and we will catch you all for next week's episode of Fruit Talk. Have a good one, everybody.